Hello and welcome to the Temple of the Silver Stars Mat public class uh, selections from Magic Without Tears. My name is Ruth and with me is Rex, my co-host. Say hi, Hello. Rex. Uh, for this class series. We are both academic track instructors at the Temple of the Silver Star. We are a nonprofit Salemic organization that's been around over 12 years and we provide two tracks of training, academic and initiatory. Both tracks were designed to provide preparatory training in ceremonial magic, Raja Yoga, Kabbalah, Tarot, Astrology, and much more. Using these foundational tools, we seek to guide the student towards a deeper apprehension of the true will and the law of the Lima and his or her own psycho-spiritual constitution. You can visit our website, totss.org to learn more about joining the academic track or being an initiate. <clears throat> uh, we have an academic campus in Los Angeles and uh, a study group in the Seattle Tots area. Um, and so we're kind of co-hosting this online course because there's a pandemic and we can't meet for classes in person. Um, and so, uh, you know, Rex is sort of the head of the uh, Seattle area group um, right now, and I'm kind of spearheading the Los Angeles effort for the moment. Um, and so we've been going over Magic Without Tears. This is our last class. Um, we are going to go over two chapters. Uh, we're going to go over chapter 75 and 81, and then we're going to have a special guest speaker uh, at the top of the hour at seven o'clock. Um, so she'll be going on for like about a half an hour. So a little bit longer class, but our special guest speaker is Heather Schubert. And she's gonna give some history on the Magic Without Tears and sort of the, the woman who was uh, the letter, one of the main letter writers that Crowley was like responding to in these, um, <clears throat> in these uh, Magic Without Tears letters. Um, she also wrote an article, I'll share that with you guys, um, called The Unknown Sorrow. So that'll be really exciting. We're super happy and grateful. Um, she's also uh, Rex's wife <laughs> and partner. So um, she'll be appearing on Rex's screen. Um, so we're really happy that she's been super generous with her time and uh, is gonna join us. Um, so yeah, just starting off, we're gonna go over chapter 75 and 81. Uh, 75 is called the AA and, and the planet. And then 81 is method of training. So. Um, the AA is, of course, like Crowley's sort of uh, initiation and training vehicle, his organization, and then, you know, the methods of training is sort of like what you might find if you join the AA or, you know, study the curriculum. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Rex, did you want to say anything about these chapters starting off? Uh, well, I, I found the first one to be rather much of a challenge to kind of get through. I don't know if that was the same experience from other people who read it. <clears throat> Yeah, so it, it I feel started like off with a lot of uh, Crowley economics, like a Crowley economics lesson. Yeah, I feel like it's not his strong point sometimes to talk about world events. <laughs> you know, he always kind of gets himself into a little bit of like weird libertarian, you know, mm -hmm. um, trouble sometimes. Yeah, and um, but I think, you know, towards the end, it kind of gets to the point which is kind of has been the case with a lot of these letters that kind of circle around kind of circular logic and then finally get to the point at the end. So we kind of see that again as well. Yeah, um, I thought AA and the planet, I, you know, I was obviously a little distracted today watching um, some of the court hearings and stuff. But, um, you know, just like reading it, I read it a couple times. And to me, it really harkens back to his chapter on you know, uh, liber all, like the morality of liber all and why, you know, we might be uncomfortable with liber all. And he's like, hey, liber all isn't the world of light and love that you want and you idealize. It's the world that we have now. And like kind of him being like, and the, the masters of the third order who sort of are in control of, you know, the world um, magically are kind of in, uh, in a line with this sort of, uh, dissolution of the current aeon and the sort of restructuring and that's it's a destructive process um, mm -hmm. that has to happen you know um, yeah, at, at, at one point too he kind of reiterates the whole master slave um function that he's kind of hammered on a few times that we've seen in the past and i think that hints at uh you know the <clears throat> the secret chiefs or the the third order whatever you want to call them being in charge of the events um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a conspiracy theory laden kind of viewpoint in a way, but I think uh, it does hit home with a lot of the other things that he uh, 
and that, some of the other writings that he's had, some of the other letters that we've read. Yeah, and actually, you know, speaking of like who the letter writer was, it actually opens with him quoting, um, you know, the, the letter he's replying to and, he, you know, the person he's, he, you know, he's replying to, they, a they, they ask, like, so you have this, you know, just the structure of AI, you sort of enter it and you're an initiate and you're like, um, kind of in the first order and that's like you're working on your own stuff. And then there's like kind of the second order, um, you know, he describes it as the RR and the AC. And then after that is the, the third order. And the third order is kind of thought of, you know, some people say it's the incarnate masters who sort of reincarnate and, or, you know, they sort of operate and, you know, they're kind of seen as like having magical powers that can kind of appear and, you know, unexpectedly and know who you are and will give you teachings. Um, you know, it's kind of a lot of different traditions talk about this. Um, you know, so Crowley's trying to like explain, you know, uh, a little bit about maybe how they function, um, at least under to his understanding. Um, you know, she, she asks like, then how are they acting at present? What impact has the new word Thelema made upon the planet? What are we to expect as a result? And can we poor benighted outsiders help them in any way? I know it's cheek to ask. <laughs> so um, it is, it's funny because I've been reading this, uh, Israel Vergardi book lately, and he kind of talks about how people become obsessed with the third order and masters and, you know, getting this like contact with the third order. And, he, you know, Rigardi was like, oh, that's kind of like, just becomes a weird egotistical thing. Like you want this connection because you want to feel special and have this power. And he's like, he's like, if they want to talk to you, they'll talk to you. Like, don't, you know, <laughs> don't become too obsessed. So, um, you know, that's kind of his attitude. Uh, Rigardi was, you know, an early student of Crowley's and then went on to do his own thing in the Golden Dawn and beyond, um, you know, but Crowley here is saying, uh, you know, he's, he's like, I don't really know. Do not forget I am myself completely in the dark with regard to the special function of most of my colleagues, you know, his third order colleagues. Um, but he, you know, he goes on to just talk about how the world is kind of messed up. Like he's like, you know, if you look at sort of these large scale mass economies that exist, you know, and obviously it's, what the, the 40s, you know, so he's talking about sort of industrialization, you know, is like this, this like large scale and mass economy, you know, it, it leads to war, you know, he's he just lived through World War Two, you know, he's seen World War One, um, you know, the first half of the 20th century was pretty, um, pretty, pretty destructive, on a level that like people hadn't seen before, um, you know, with this like mass in industrialization of uh, weaponry. Um, you know, and then he talks about Garrett Garrett, who's like a, an, an essay for, I guess he, he was a ex, kind of an extreme libertarian. Um, so he likes this libertarian guy. I uh, did a little research. He was sort of a inspiration for Ayn Rand's John Galt, <laughs> one of his characters. So I was like, ah, all right, cool. Um, but he, you know, he's like basically most economies eventually, you know, they fail when they scale up. So that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, he's like, uh, to even most stupid, it becomes plain that at this stage, war is wholly ruinous, organization breaks down, one meaningless revolution follows another, famine and pestilence complete the job, you know, um, towards this collapse, all totalitarian movements inevitably tend. Um, so he's just saying, like, none of, none of these systems work, and they're breaking down. And, you know, he kind of harkens this back to the Thelemic idea of the shifts of the aeons. And he's saying, you know, when Osiris replaced Isis, so, you know, in his sort of cosmology, there was a matri matriarchal society that was kind of, Isis was the, the goddess of, of that and the symbol of that. And Christianity sort of came in and, you know, this patriarchal sort of culture was really like took over um, you know, he, he kind of points to it being Christianity. And so Osiris was the god of this aeon. Um, and so now us moving into like the aeon of Horus, um, you know, we kind of see this like sort of dark age usher in and destroy all of the structures that were built by the, you know, um, the age of Osiris, uh, which has kind of peaked and is now in decline. Um, so Rex, did you think we add to that sort of yeah, I, I think, I mean, if you look at what Crowley, where he's coming from, I mean, he's uh, from an aristocratic background. And so, you know, when he's writing this, he's seen 
two world wars and you've seen the decline of the aristocracy in, in, uh, in England specifically. And um, so you can kind of see where he's coming from with a lot of that stuff. But I think the, you know, the tying it back to the three ions is, is uh, you know, that's classic Thelema cosmology right there. And uh, so, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's sort of interesting because he talks about, you know, um, laws are fine when they work to help people find their true will, but when laws are unjust, monstrous, ridiculous, you know, the average man will become a criminal and the law, you know, requires a Gestapo with dictatorial powers and no safeguards to maintain a farce and corruption becomes normal in official circles and it's excused, you know, so it's like once these systems kind of peak and start to decline, it, it just makes people like, it's, it's hard to inhabit those systems and try to pursue your true will. It becomes like a, a hindrance, hence like the need for those systems to sort of, you know, dissolve. Um, it's interesting to, to contrast that with, uh, you know, his, his Libra Oz, for example, you know, mm -hmm. which outlines the, the rights of man. Um, uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, it, you know, it's well worth the read, you know, man has the right to do what he will, to write what he will and on and on, but uh, to think about that in, in terms of what he's saying here, I think it's an interesting contrast. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, the more I read Crowley, the more I just think he really believes in like the, you know, the individual liberation is the kind of the most important thing, um, you know, so society in the age of, of the aeon of Horace, that's kind of like the, the thing we should be striving for to rebuild society on is like what will liberate people. Um, or so it, it would seem to me. Um, sure. You and know, writers, writers like uh, you know Jack Parsons, for example, his freedom as a two-edged sword, I think, carried that idea forward. Uh, yeah. You know, he he did uh, the part of that essay is about, or part of that book is an essay on uh, purpose of government, and uh, government is it, it exists basically. I'm paraphrasing. It exists to protect the rights of the individual, and if it's not doing that, then it's either anarchy or tyranny. Yeah, and then just getting back to him talking about, you know, the, the gods, um, you know, he says that when his, his wife, uh, he calls her, his first wife, Rose, uh, he calls her Oretta here, you know, when she was receiving the book of the law, um, you know, he's saying like, you know, she didn't know anything about like magic or gods or anything, but she was very clear and precise as to like what the instructions were. She was like, there's a group of people and they're telling me that the new Aeon was to supersede the old. And his Crowley's special job was to pre preserve the sacred tradition so that a new Renaissance might in due season rekindle the hidden light. I was accordingly to make a quintessence of the ancient wisdom and publish it in as a permanent form as possible. And so that's why he made the Equinox, which is like his series um, of uh, books. You can, you can find the Equinox in, uh, it, it's it's in a lot of places now. It was kind of hard to get, you know, because it's it's just like this, you know, huge ten volume collection or ten. Pretty expensive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Speech in the silence has is reissued um, all ten of the first, uh, you know, series, um, and they like scanned them. Um, they're they're awesome. You can buy them on uh, Amazon if you want the hardbacks or, or the paperbacks if you'd like to have the collection, um, but. You know, it is filled with like a lot of sort of weird articles and poetries and play that you're like, why is this, why is this in here? Um, and Crowley kind of makes the excuse that he thought like people would buy it if they thought there was like some fun stuff in it, but it was also act as kind of like a carrier for the more important information. This is justification for the equinox. He calls it a Rosetta Stone <laughs> in this article, so. That's kind of yeah, interesting. So he, he clearly sees himself as someone who's you know preserving the knowledge, the hidden knowledge for future generations this way. And that's kind of what he's portraying. And being guided by the secret chiefs or by the third order is uh, you know, he sees that as part of that plan. Yeah, and then he's just kind of like, you know, it's weird that the secret chiefs are kind of could be seen as almost aiding this destructive principle, like these wars and you know, like is, you know, he speculates, you know, the evils of people like Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini, and Mikado are acting towards this goal. Um, yeah, Pluto, uh, you know, Sarah's saying that Pluto is kind of part of this, like tra the transformer, you know, in astrology. Um, 
you know, and he's saying, well, this is a lot like in the Christian mythology, you know, you have Judas and, you know, um, you have like Pontius Pilate and, and Herod, you know, no less than Jesus are actors in this drama, um, you know, to replace the new Aeon, Isis by Osiris and the great formula, um, you know, and he says, this is true, but it doesn't uh, excuse these, <laughs> these criminals, you know, um, but he tries to kind of like make sense, I guess, of the horrors in the world. Uh, by saying like, well, this is all just part of, you know, the, the plan, the unfolding um, of the new Aeon. And so, you know, just take a step back and, um, you know, maybe, maybe it shouldn't be stopped. Maybe it's part of something bigger. So. Sure. Well, even that, that, that reminds me of like, you know, in the list of Gnostic saints and Helena, um, I think it's Hippolytus that is a Gnostic, you know, he's listed in the Gnostic saints, but he was actually, a, um, he was, he was a huge enemy of the Gnostics, but the reason why he's a Gnostic saint is because his his writings against the Gnostics are what survive, and we wouldn't even know about a lot about what the Gnostics were if it weren't for his rant against it. So he's kind of like an anti-hero from that standpoint. Yeah, and he kind of, you know, he concludes, he says, you know, I don't think the masters need to be unanimous, a practical plan might be for them to concentrate on one particular group or one part of the world and you need to keep this in as good a shape as possible until the time has come for nature to grow a new set. So, um, you know, he's just kind of encouraging, I think, us to sort of focus on like our local groups, um, you know, in our, a region and try to like participate as much as we can in, in uh, you know, maintaining the knowledge and you know, prosecuting the great work within like a regional um, sort of sense. And this really reminded me of sort of like the Southern California, you know, movement um, that like Phyllis Seckler was part of and Jack Parsons, you know, all of the, you know, the OTO and the, um, the AA and all those organizations kind of couldn't really function in Europe. Uh, you know, during World War II, like, you know, Germer was put in a concentration camp, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but in Southern California, you know, Jane Wolf lived uh, here and she was able to continue, um, you know, teaching, uh, you know, Sir, Sir Merrill and other students um, through the AA. And, you know, I believe she was one of the, you know, actors and founders of the OTO in Southern California. And that was one of the only functioning, you know, OTOs in the world for a while. Um, and then, you know, Grady McMurtry, um, he sort of came and married Phyllis Seckler and they started the OTO and, you know, got Lon Mulejuket on board and now he's teaching, but, you know, it was a really sort of small flame that was kind of uh, held, um, held a lit for uh, a really, you know, for decades even. And, you know, that was one of the reasons Germer was so into just getting all of Crowley's work published was he didn't want it to, he didn't want the equinox to, to die. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I think there's some forethought uh, and maybe a little prognostication in this essay. Um, so moving on, sorry, Heather, it's, <laughs> we're getting towards seven, uh, to the next chapter, um, methods of training. So, you know, if you are sort of a student of Crowley or in his lineage, um, you know, here's uh, what he's telling you to do. Um, you know, he's, he's like, first and foremost, keep a diary. You know, that's one of the primary ways that you're going to start accessing um, magical knowledge and also like how I can keep track of you and tell you if you're doing okay. Um, so Rex, did you have anything to add to that? Like just this chapter is sort of. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of just a rundown, I think of his uh, recommendations for basic magical, not just magical practices, but um, reference books and other things that, people, that anyone in the, on the magical path should should be familiar with and uh yeah certainly magical record is something that he he stressed with all of his students and uh you know even today that's a huge part of, of magical training so that uh your that your teachers can understand where you're at what you're doing and what progress you're making so it's it is a key a key feature yeah you know and sometimes like i i wish i had a i had kept a diary you know 10 years ago and i was having like dreams and you know kind of doing magic on my own i'm like yeah because a lot of the stuff now has great importance in my life, but I didn't write it down. So it's kind of one of those things where it's really nice to have a record of, you know, sort of things that happen that you feel like might be significant. 
Um, so you can like look back in time and sort of uh, this is this to me kind of calls to like the one of the essence of like the the methods of science, the aim of religion is like it is collecting empirical data in a way like you're saying like I did this. This is what happened you know, in a very scientific way. He's like, we have to be like chemists, you know, we have to be like scientists, um, which I kind of appreciate. Uh, I think it also convinces people that wouldn't normally be interested in somebody's work in the future or after someone's death to be interested in it because a diary has, you know, the, it's, it's an esoteric, mystical, secretive thing that we think we're not supposed to look at. We believe that it's someone, so in a way it kind of tricks people into wanting to get to know somebody. Hey, let's look at that secret diary that we're not supposed to look at, you know, like the red book, like let's look at this thing that they wanted to keep hidden. But in a sense, like you don't really want it to be hidden. You want them to get to know you. Yeah, I mean, it depends. You know, some people are pretty private about their diary. You know, um, some people would love to share it. Uh, we do have, uh, I think Todd's published, it was Jane Wolfe's Magical Diary from her time, um, you know, in Chefalu, uh, studying with Crowley. And then after he left, she was remained there. Uh, it's kind of hard to read because it's written out longhand. But um, it is, it's fascinating to see how, you know, she was taught and uh, to have a record of that. Um, I don't know if she ever wanted it published or not, but we, we, we did it. <laughs> it's out there. Um, well, it's one of the few times too between Jane Wolfe's diaries and Germer's diaries where we can actually see Crowley's feedback to them as his teacher. It sounded brutal. <laughs> he was kind of a tough teacher. You know, it's, it's just the, the, the most basic thing you can do. So uh, I would say if you are an aspiring magician, <laughs> you know, uh, get in the habit, um, you know, and then he also talks about it like the Lieber uh, Thrishab, I believe we referenced this in a previous um, talk, but, uh, you know, that's sort of the magical, the steps for magical um, memory to come back. And a lot of that is sort of like thinking, learning how to think backwards and recalling your past. Um, he also talks about like writing down sort of autobiographical information you should begin with your parents and family traditions, the circumstance of your birth and education, social position, financial situation, your physique, health, illness, you know, all of this stuff. Um, and then eventually how you became to be interested in the great work. And, uh, you know, if there's any sort of false trails that you followed, sham Rosicrucians <laughs> be listed. And then, uh, you know, has been your previous condition of servitude and then how you found me and how you did enlist my aid. So he kind of requires you to sort of like do that exercise of thinking back in your life and remembering and, and engaging with magical memory. Um, and then, yeah, just in your diary, put down what practices you mean to begin, how you get on with them from day to day uh, and at intervals and what you have to say about your progress. Um, there is an example of Crowley's diary, Saint John St. John, um, you know, it's just like his magical record that he's published, uh, which is like, it's, it's amazing to see how detailed he is. He's like 1152, ate some crackers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, did it, you know, did a magical ritual. My friend came over, you know, feeling lethargic. Um, it's incredibly detailed, but, uh, if you can get to that level, you know, more power to you, like that's, it's all, it's helpful. Um, yeah, and then he kind of goes on to talk about the twofold method uh, that, you know, he, he employs to how to practice, um, you know, magic and also yoga is kind of the, the other thing. Um, he says yoga is an introversion and magic is an extroversion. He says the two at first seem opposed, but when you have uh, advanced a little in both, you find the concentration learned in yoga is of immense use in attaining mental powers necessary in magic. And on the other hand, the discipline of magic is the greatest service in yoga. Um, you know, and then he points us to uh, you know his own writings in yoga, like all of the big blue brick book four. Um, you know, I think it's part one uh, is yoga. And then he has eight lectures on yoga, which goes over bhakti yoga, and raja yoga, you know, these different types of like love and mind and different ways to practice. Um, it's not just physical, uh, you know, hatha yoga or pranayama, but like beyond that. Um, and then, you know, Vivekananda uh, raja yoga, which is like yoga, mind and concentration. That's on, uh, I think it's on the AA reading list as well. So 
there's some stuff for you to start off with. <laughs> Just a couple, a couple things. It's a starting reading list. Yeah. yeah. And then Rex, did you want to go over the magic books? Well, uh, you know, book, book, the big blue brick is, uh, you know, that's the classic of, of Crowley's uh, body of work. And um, there's just so much in there. He, I think he wrote it intentionally, intentionally for beginners, but in typical Crowley fashion, it, it kind of ventures off into some very advanced territory pretty quickly. But um, yeah, but it's, it's a key keystone to all of, uh, you know, all of Crowley's system of magic. Yeah, he also adds the Book of Thoth, which I think was interesting. Um, the Book of Thoth is his sort of commentary on like his tarot card system that he worked with uh, Lady Frida Harris on. Uh, and it's, it's really great if you study tarot. Um, it, I just find the more I read it, the, the richer it gets. Um, and then he also mentions uh, the Book of Sacred Magic of Abermelon. That's sort of a, an invocation of your holy guardian angel. Um, which is a pretty advanced ritual. And he says, uh, you know, any of Levi's works, you know, the trend, transcendental uh, magic, um, all that stuff is really good. He thought he was a reincarnation of Aphelius Levi. So <laughs> of course he would recommend him. Um, yeah, and then, you know, he just kind of talks about why yoga and magic are so important. Um, you know, I really love his definition of magic here sort of towards the end. He says, magic explores and learns to control those regions of nature which lie beyond the objects of sense. Reaching the highest parts of these regions called the divine, one proceeds by exaltation, in intoxication, yes, a sort of sub sublime sort of the consciousness to identify oneself with those celestial beings. Mm -hmm. You know, which is a little bit more complex than the science and art of causing change. Yeah, and I think it's good. It's important that he's pairing that with yoga because yoga is, you know, control of the body, control of the breathing, control of the mind by virtue of those controls. But then magic is, is when you go beyond that and, you know, look beyond the veil of, of the senses. So it's, yeah, he says it, it, in magic, on the, contrary, on the contrary, one passes through the veil of the exterior world. Um, yoga, in another sense, uh, you know, the senses become unreal by comparison as one possesses, passes beyond them. So it's sort of like you realize your senses are sort of, you know, not really giving you good feedback and aren't, aren't real either. Um, and so through magic, you, you can create the subtle body um, or instrument is a better term called the body of light. This one develops and controls and it gains new powers as one progresses. Um, the first step in yoga is keep still. The first step in magic is travel beyond the world of the senses. There, that is the whole business in a nutshell and expressed so that anyone, however ignorant of the subject, may grasp the essentials, I hope. He closes. So um, we can have a little bit of discussion and then we'll have Heather uh, on. Um, does anyone have any questions? We do, um, you know, if anyone is interested in joining the AA, uh, we recommend um, onestarinsight.org. Uh, that's kind of our sort of branch that we can vouch for. Um, there are other uh, branches of the AA. Um, you know, some of them are great, I, but we can only vouch for one. So <laughs> that's our official stance. And in, in that regard, I mean, uh, you know, just to, to plug TOTS for a second, I mean, TOTS is more of a teaching order in preparation for AA work. Um, it was devised by Phyllis Seckler in finding that a lot of her AA students were not yet prepared for actual AA work. And so it, it was, uh, her idea was to kind of get people kind of, you know, bootstrapped with the basics so that they could start AA work. And it's, uh, but it's its own path. It's its own path of uh, attainment on its own. So it's in support of AA, but it's a separate, it's, it's not actually the AA. Yeah, it's kind of like Crowley um, assumed that everyone had gone through the Golden Dawn's first order, at least. And so he started AA sort of to, you know, with that assumption, you already had all of that knowledge. So if you haven't gone through the AA curriculum um, and that track, uh, you know, TOTS helps to fill in some of that, those gaps that you might have, you know, might have wanted to learn um, in the past. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of. I think you're going to have to make me the host. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
I'm just going to close close this off because I'll probably make this two videos. So that was part one of our last class um, from Selection with Magic Without Tears. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you know, obviously there's more information at uh, totss.org if you want to, you know, say hi, make contact. And we also have Facebook pages. Uh, so check us out. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for an awesome class. We'll have a, a guest speaker after this. So. Well, thanks, Rex, for being my awesome co-host, too. Thank you. Thank you both as well.